Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. And this time round, we've uh, got a very interesting and very historic car here. Uh, this is a Ferrari 250 GT. It's a 1958 Ferrari 250 GT Pininfarina Coupe. Uh, and um, it's, uh, <laughs> this is a very interesting car because it's the first right-hand drive, first new Ferrari, sorry, right-hand drive or left-hand drive sold in the UK, as far as I understand it. The first ever Ferrari sold in the UK, new. Now, um, I will throw a question mark on that because uh, in the 1990s, when I had um, my classic car restoration business up in Wallasey, um, I had a good friend who owned a museum and had a, a fantastic collection of cars and motorcycles called Jim Baxter, Scottish gentleman. And he had two Ferraris from the 1950s, but I think they were bought in Europe and then uh, brought into this country. So I think I'm on, it's generally accepted in the wider press that this is the first ever Ferrari sold in the UK, but I will just put that rider on it because I may know uh, something a bit different. But uh, either way, this is a very, very rare car. They made 353 of the Pinaferina Coupes uh, allegedly nine right-hand drive only and um, one of the, the other reasons why this car is so interesting historically is apart from the fact that it is potentially car number one for the UK um, is the fact that it was uh, it was delivered two cars were delivered in 1958 um, to a garage called Tourist Trophy Garage in Farnham uh, in the south of England and that was owned by a uh, young racing driver called Mike Hawthorne and Mike Hawthorne had the uh, the uh, the fantastic achievement of winning the Formula One Grand Prix World Championship for Ferrari in 1958. As a result of the winning the World Championship for Ferrari in 1958 he had great favour with ends of Ferrari and he wanted to actually Ferrari to gift him his Grand Prix racing car and Enzo said no. And like a lot of cars at that time, they were either modified or even dare I say it stripped and used, recycled, used for other uh, cars or parts. Um, but uh, what Enzo Ferrari did say to him was, I have not sold any cars in the UK. So would you like to set up a dealership, a concessionaire in the UK? And Mike Hawthorne said yes. Um, and two of these cars were delivered, this and another car in late 1958, on the back of Mike Hawthorne's relationship with Enzo Ferrari. Um, this car has been on this original British registration, 5 HPD, from that time, from 1958, which is rather lovely. Um, and the, um, the car was actually, the, the, the second car, Mike Hawthorne died tragically in 1959, I think, in a, in a uh, a famous road accident, I think driving a Mark I or Mark II Jaguar. Um, and I think Rob Walker was driving his Mercedes 300 SL Gullwing and they were having a race. But again, I'm prepared to be uh, corrected on that because I'm not an automobile historian as such. I'm more interested in the nuts and bolts and oily bits. Mike Hawthorne was, uh, was sent these two cars and invoice for them by Enzo Ferrari. Um, this car got sold to an Irish uh, aristocrat and the other car got sold to um, a gentleman called Colonel Ronnie Hoare. And uh, Colonel Hoare uh, loved his other Ferrari 250 GT Penifarina Coupe so much that he actually approached Enzo Ferrari and said, I would like to be your UK concessionaire. Of course, Mike Hawthorne had died in this tragic accident. And Enzo Ferrari said yes, and the rest is history because Marinello concessionaires that exists today in 2023 um, uh, actually was founded by Colonel Ronnie Hoare. So it was all very much personal relationships and um, friendships and handshakes and verbal agreements and all that sort of stuff that we don't really have uh, now unfortunately um, but this car is so it's it's car number one right hand drive officially and the uh, the car has recently changed hands it was uh, owned by a 
customer of mine up in Cheshire here, and it uh, changed hands and got sold to um, Christopher Haynes. Now, uh, the name Haynes will be, I imagine, massively synonymous to, uh, to a lot of people because Haynes, um, John Haynes, Christopher's dad, was the, the workshop manual mogul. And um, John Haynes built a huge empire uh, based on the sales of his workshop manuals. And I have a big collection of them, actually, got, dating back to my misspent youth. And here's one of them on the Jaguar Daimler V12. Uh, the very familiar format of the Haynes workshop manuals. And they sold gazillions of these things around the world. And um, Christopher has uh, sort of taken over that, that dynasty with the fabulous Haynes Motor Museum uh, in Yeovil in Somerset, which is well worth a visit. Um, this car he bought as part of his collection, his private collection, and we were uh, fantastically honoured a little while back to be uh, given the, the job of rebuilding the engine on it for him. I mean, um, he's very knowledgeable, he's very car savvy. Um, I consider it a fantastic privilege to have done this car for him, to be, of all the gen joints in all the world, the car ended up at mine. The interesting thing about this car is it's, um, they made 353 Pininfarina coupes with this rather, dare I say, in very hushed tones, slightly bland body style, which um, is sort of in the same era as the, the Farina, Morris Oxfords and Austin Cambridges. There are styling cues in both of them, the four-door saloons that were built for um, British Motor Corporation at the time and Ferrari, and I, I, again, I, I do say that in very hushed tones, but I, uh, I do believe there are some styling cue similarities. We shall say no more, but still an elegant two plus two car, but because the Ferrari 250 GT is, um, is a very, very adaptable vehicle under the skin, a lot of these cars, the ones that survive, are no longer um, 250 GT Pininfarina Coupes because if you take the body off, if you lift the body shell off the chassis uh, and all the running gear, engine, all the, the mechanical underpinnings are on the chassis frame, suspension, wheels, etc. If you lift the body off, you can actually convert it into a far more exotic alike Ferrari, um, such as a California Spider or a 250 short wheelbase. This car has a wheelbase of 2,600 millimetres uh, and the 250 short wheelbase, clue in the title, uh, had that reduced in 1959, I think, round about the same contemporaneous with this car, to 2,400 millimetres. So 200 millimetres shorter, eight inches. And um, they, uh, they, they were able to shorten the car and eventually, I mean, the California Spider, for example, went through two generations. The long wheelbase with the four vents here and the short wheelbase with three vents here. That's the easiest way of identifying whether your California Spider is worth 20, $25 million or $30 million. Um, but anyway, um, so this is a very original car and I believe one of nine right-hand drive cars only built. So they had the two of them there, the two of nine, and um, this is, uh, so, Long and short of all that is, this is an extremely rare car. It is excruciatingly rare. Um, a to B, uh, the first ever, it's one of one, first ever car allegedly sold in the UK. B, uh, they only made 353 of this body style to start with. C, a lot of them were had the bodies removed and far more exotic bodies put on them. Um, there were probably a few that rusted and crashed along the way as well because some of them do. Uh, unless they've been rebuilt by unscrupulous people, which some of them are. We used to have a joke, with, particularly with racing cars. If they made 10 of a particular model of racing car, it was one of the 25 surviving examples of the 10 originally built. Um, believe it or not, there is some truth in that. The car is now finished. Uh, it's ready to go back. And we've rebuilt the engine and I'll be showing some more details. In fact, let's do it now. Let's show some inside details on the engine. Well, here we have a, uh, the engine out of the black car. And um, it's, it, this is what I would call a typical early Colombo, uh, Gioacchino Colombo 
of Colombo getting mixed up with American uh, fictional detectives, uh, V12, and um, the it's architecturally a very elegant engine. It's uh, got these hairspring valve springs on them um, instead of having the, the traditional which it has become now coil spring round the stem of the valve. Um, you've got these springs either side which l work like that. Uh, and this was uh, sort of, you know, pretty standard technology in road engines, in, in um, high performance road engines in the 1950s, motorcycles and things. Uh, the cylinder heads, the, um, one of the restrictions on this engine um, is that they had what's called the three stud design. So um, you have the, the stud here and here at the bottom of the cylinder head, which is um, tightened up by uh, nuts under here, a line of them. Um, but on the inside, you've only got one stud at the top of each cylinder holding the head gasket, clamping the head down to the gasket. And that's only just um, good enough, particularly as the engine started to stretch in size. Uh, 250 GT comes from 250 cc per cylinder. Times 12 is 3000, three litre. Uh, a lot of Ferrari engines are named on that. But if I just pull this masking tape off here, which Les has put on to, uh, to stop anything un horrible happening to the inlet tracts, there are the inlet ports, and you can see there's only three of them for six cylinders. So we immediately have a restriction in terms of gas flow, which on a high performance V12 engine, you can only get away with for so long. And here we have the aforementioned um, six studs on this side, one for the top of each cylinder, there, 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 etc. Um, so all this meant, and this is what's called an inside plug engine, the, uh, the carburettors as that sits in the car, this is um, that away, so that this is the top of the engine and the carburettors, the three carburettors sit on here. It's, it's great, but it's restricted. And this is what Ferrari was increasingly um, coming against in the late 1950s. But one of the things about Enzo Ferrari was that between um, Gioacchino uh, Colombo and um, and Aurelio Lampredi, the other, his other engine designer, he always had to do no more than that, dig into his parts bin and find something um, a little more intoxicating or uh, advanced, and he could just up the ante, and that's what he did. Um, this engine works very well, but this three stud design, particularly as it's not clamping all of the cylinder head, just this portion of it, it's not coming through from the top to clamp the whole thing down. It means that um, under the pressures of this engine running at 7,000 RPM, you get um, things moving uh, a little too much, little too much movement, which is uh, never a good thing in my experience. Um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, so, also, there's no room for six, six, a six carburetor setup. Uh, there's no, only three inlet tracts uh, instead of one per cylinder, six. So the whole thing is um, getting restricted. It works ever so well. Uh, and this engine was used in the, uh, the late 1950s in all the 250 GTs, this type of engine. But um, lots of improvements could be made to it. It has uh, got a triple timing chain um, and that uh, is a good thing. Uh, in fact, over here is the timing chest, um, which has the chain, etc., enclosed in it, and that obviously goes on top of the front of the on, on the front of the engine, essentially. Um, and the timing chain tension on these engines is very critical. Normally, with a chain, it's if one does that, I can feel lots of play in that chain. Um, if you can rock it back and two like that, then you know it's, uh, it's not good news. It needs a new one. And what can actually happen is uh, the oil pickup pipe comes from under here. This is the oil strainer here, the gauze strainer. This is the sump that fits on the bottom of the engine. So this is normally full of oil here. You've got this beautiful um, billet crankshaft, fully machined, which Ferrari used. This rather intriguing bit of rubber hose, which the engine sucked its oil supply up through. I mean, 
moderately crazy, really, that they would use a bit of rubber hose to suck the blood of the engine, essentially, up through. But it comes up here, and um, this is part of the timing chest um, paraphernalia that sits on the front of the engine here. Uh, ooh, I'm having a great deal of difficulty starting up thread. Not used to those. Um, and uh, what happens is the timing chain can actually rub against this oil pickup pipe, this oil feed pipe. And of course, eventually, as the chain goes round here at great speed when the engine's running fast, that chain can actually eat through that. And once again, you've got a potential threat to the oil feed of the whole engine. Um, you can see the witness marks on that pipe. So um, one or two hazardous, hazardous things on this engine. I mean, a great piece of industrial design, but, um, and it did rightly, as I say, Enzo Ferrari just went like that and improved it over the years. He came up with some um, much better cylinder heads on the later cars. You can see it's got six exhaust ports coming out the side to a manifold, which would then go down towards the back of the car. This, of course, being horizontal. Um, and uh, this is the way it should be. And eventually the inlet match that and you get proper gas flow. Uh, the other thing I do want to mention is these uh, tappets. These are a later type of tappet. The rocker there, it's a roller uh, follower rocker which depresses against the valve as the cam lobe comes round, pushes this up, pushes that against the valve. That's the tappet clearance you can hear there, which is very important. Uh, if you don't have that, the valves don't seat properly and they burn, and you don't get proper uh, sealing in the combustion chamber. But the interesting thing is, this, this sort of end on the, the tappet screw here, the earlier Ferraris had a, a tapered pin, like the end of a knitting needle, which acted on the top of the valve, and it was a very tenuous arrangement. It worked, but boy did they wear, because it was virtually came to a point, and it's pushing down against these immense valve springs, and um, they wore quickly. So these are uh, later um, tappets. Uh, I, I refer to them to GTO type tappets because I think from memory, I'm digging very deep here. The 250 GTO was one of the first engines to have these improved tappets because obviously that was designed for the hard school of, uh, of the racetrack, uh, which took no prisoners basically. Um, so that's the overview uh, of the um, the Colombo V12, starter motor fits there, um, cam covers, these beautiful cam covers, crackle finished, and uh, this is how they came from the factory. But what a lot of people did, as they do now, this obviously is relieved, this Ferrari, into the, um, into the casting. They file that off, same as Lamborghini did in, uh, in the 1960s and 70s for people so, so that they when they opened the bonnet they knew they had a ferrari it wasn't just subtly uh, relieved in there it was plain for all to see because the aluminium finish uh, leapt out in contrast against the black crackle finish some people even filed the paint off these ribs um, we've kept this standard and we're going to let our customer uh, mr haynes choose which actual finish he wants. Does he want the factory finish or, as a lot of them are now, filed down and polished up to uh, so you can see the Ferrari script in all its glory? Difficult choice. What would you do? Would you keep it like that or would you highlight the Ferrari? Interesting question. But um, that is essentially uh, the Ferrari 250 GT engine. One other thing to mention, he says, is the fuel pump, the mechanical fuel pump, which is driven off the engine. And um, the pump, which is there, beautiful piece of engineering. Um, it literally moves three millimeters, that plunger. It's all sufficiently engineered and beautifully set up that these FISPA mechanical pumps only have to move a tiny amount to move the diaphragm up and down to do their job properly. Um, and uh, I've, I've come across several situations in the past where people say, oh, the, uh, the drive, the drive um, 
cam in the engine is worn because it's only the, the plunger in the side of the block is only moving three millimeters that's what they should move um, it's it's very very important to know uh, these things beautiful Italian art lovely cast alloy cooling fan uh, with its own little pedestal its own mounting piece of piece of engineering art really uh, but when you think those four blades are cooling a three litre v12 engine uh, <laughs> it's a big ask really but it, it works it works um, so there we are we'll uh, we'll go on to the next stage well Les is going to finish building the engine up and we'll put it back in the car well, what hallmarks the Ferrari 250 GT? And this, again, another reason why this was such a landmark car for Ferrari's history is because it was their first fully productionized car. Uh, 353 was a big number for Ferenzo Ferrari in uh, the late 50s and early 60s to make. We find that laughable now, but by his standards, this was a mass production on a truly industrial scale. This engine, the Colombo V12, um, is a, uh, was a masterpiece of uh, engineering. Um, Colombo, Giacomo Colombo designed it for Enzo Ferrari. Um, beautiful architecturally. It did have some limitations and it had some development cul-de-sacs and some things that uh, had to change, as every design does, as it gets more adapted and more, uh, more asked of it. But um, a lovely, lovely piece. It's an all aluminium V12, um, lovely piece of industrial design, which went on right through until the early 1990s, actually, in the Ferrari 412. As I say, heavily modified, but um, that engine. It's funny, I've driven a lot of Ferrari 250 GTs over the years, um, including the Tour de France that I rebuilt mechanically re rebuilt in the 90s and they all feel surprise surprise very very similar and uh, this is the first time we've actually uh, taken this car on the road since uh, the engine's been rebuilt and we've done a few other jobs on it uh, everything's behaving itself absolutely beautifully oil pressure is about 75 pounds per square inch and it's a mechanical gauge on these, so uh, no electrical sender with a, an electrical uh, gauge, which means it is more accurate. Uh, but um, yeah, it feels, it feels good. A little bit of a driveline vibration, but um, I'm sure the people at the Haynes Museum will sort that out. Um, and I'm just gently kissing the throttle because of the newness of this engine and it's going very well quite warm in here seems to remember that's another facet of ferrari 250 gts uh, but um uh yeah this is uh, as i mentioned this is a rare car uh, they made 353 i don't know how many are left but it's not very many uh, oh yes this is lovely. It really is. Very nice. Um, I won't be, uh, won't be extending this engine through the rev range because it is hours old only. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's lovely. It really is. He says trying to select reverse gear at uh, 50 miles an hour. Uh, no, this is lovely. It really is. Um, what a pity that uh, so many of these cars have been converted into California Spiders or 250 short wheelbases. But there's something magical about this car. Something magical. Well, I'm just going to accelerate very slightly in it. Uh, we're doing about uh, 2,000 RPM. was up to 4,000 and uh, it sounds very very happy yeah beautiful um, it really is it's um, even though this engine was as I mentioned earlier um, 
a sort of uh, a technological cul-de-sac, I suppose you'd call it, in the late 1950s. Certainly the road cars with those three inlet ports. It's still very pleasing. Um, and yeah, it's a very tractable engine, this um, uh, Enzo Ferrari, uh, obviously uh, stipulated, but um, I'm not going to do it because this engine's new, but it can pull from, from tick over very easily. Um, that's about 1500 revs. And the, the litmus test of a well-tuned Ferrari of this era not a competition car particularly because they uh, it, it's not as easy to do in those because of gas flow reasons and valve overlap which I will make a video about at some point it'll pull to sort of uh, 7,000 rpm this when it's right which was heady heady speeds for uh, at the 1950s heady speeds indeed when most cars were still running on push rods and uh, one carburetor oh. Yeah, it wants to go, this car. Really does. I'm, I'm holding it back. It's, uh, it's very good. Lovely. In fact, as, as the revs build up, it's smoothing out, which is, uh, which is great. Um, when the valves are adjusted properly, uh, which we, we've done a base setting on the tappets, the valve clearances, but inevitably, they do go out of adjustment as things bed in. Um, they, uh, they do need resetting. And eventually, the valve gear, when it's all run in and beautifully working properly, it should have a hiss to it. Uh, the tappet should, should have a sort of hissing noise coming from the top of each engine as they all work uh, in, in symphony. And. Uh, any t any tapping is actually a slightly wide tapping. This one, I have to say, is not bad at the moment, but um, yeah, very nice. <laughs> it's quite a quite a handful to handle this car um, on these tyres. Uh, it really is. It's very much of its age, but um, I think Mr. Haynes is going to be very happy with this. And it's still on its running in oil. It's not really got the proper oil in it. And the reason we put uh, running in oil in is to, um, I mean, I've had customers say before now when we've rebuilt engines, can you please put synthetic oil in from the start? I'd like you to put this high specification oil, Mobile One or whatever. And I say, uh, depending on the engine, of course, uh, I say absolutely not on old classic car engines. You need to put a running in oil in them. And the reason for that is, that um, if the oil is too high quality, it actually forms a film on the inside of the bores and on the piston rings and the boundary layer, as it's called, is it, it's very thick and uh, it stops the parts um, rubbing together, which is fine, but the piston rings don't actually get a chance to bed into the bores. That they, they actually have to have a sort of rubbing, a, bra a lighter braiding action to actually bed in and seal properly. And that's why running in oil is actually very important. I think it's phosphorus from memory that uh, is missing or from running in oil. Um, and it's there for a reason. But it's, it's quite thin. Um, it degrades very quickly. The engines smoke a bit when that's uh, in it. But that's, that's fine. C'est la vie. Yeah, just a tiny tickle of the throttle. And she's off. No, it isn't. That's a drive line problem. No. Isn't that interesting? That's what road tests are for. going to take this very slowly. I'll have to limp it back to the garage.
Well, what can sometimes happen is, particularly uh, if, if it's not been a full restoration and had a full shakedown, the car did throw a slight curveball at us at the last minute. Uh, I was out road testing it and I noted a driveline vibration, um, which turned out to be uh, something fortunately easy to fix, but nevertheless uh, quite interesting at the time because there was an ominous bang underneath the, uh, the car towards the back end and uh, part of the prop shaft donut had actually decided to launch itself uh, in the general direction of the road. So we've had to get a prop shaft uh, donut, a replacement which Alex has been fixing uh, and uh, doing, and the car is now um, fixed. We've had that done. This is, this is typical, this is what happens in classic car restoration. The best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, well, this is the uh, aforementioned donut, and a lot of cars in the late 50s and 60s used these, some Formula One cars. Um, Lotuses uh, used them, and they were a, a very clever way of um, joining a prop shaft to a differential or the back of a gearbox or whatever. And the construction is, uh, it's bonded rubber with these uh, metal inserts, and the whole thing can move as the uh, the prop shaft and the joint moves underneath the car and it can also take up the torque it's a sort of cush drive like motorbikes have on them um, but the uh, as you can see part of it has actually unglued itself and uh, launched itself away so we've got a new one of those Alex has fitted it and the car is now driving beautifully um, so uh, the car is going to be delivered to uh, Chris Haynes uh, Christopher Haynes in the next uh, couple of days and we'll be, uh, yeah, we'll be meeting him down there for the handover. Well, here we are. We've dropped the car off at the Haynes Museum. This is uh, Chris Haynes. None other. <laughs> Beware of imitations. <laughs> Beware of imitations. Um, and um, obviously we're going to take the Ferrari for a drive and all that good stuff, but um, the museum here is utterly amazing. Yeah, please tell me a little bit about the collection and the museum. So, um, my father John Haynes, obviously the founder of the Haynes Publishing Group, the Haynes Manual. Yep. Um, he had a car collection and uh, about 30 cars dotted around Somerset and the factory where they used to publish the books is just across the road. <laughs> and uh, he had a car collection that he had squirreled away in friends' barns and all over the place. And um, he got, got some advice and they decided the best thing he could do with this car collection because he didn't want to, he wanted to grow it. He didn't want yep. to sell it. It wasn't about, particularly about his financial legacy. It was something that he was growing. And suddenly um, his accountant and, um, and uh, accountant and lawyer suggested that if he created a charitable trust he could gift his collection to the to this charitable trust an educational charitable trust and he thought what a splendid idea so he gifted his collection built a building which was far end behind the black box as we call it um, and then over the following sort of 20 years he went from a collection of about 30 cars to over 400 um, and the museum just grew massively um, and we um, run the museum as a, uh, a visitor attraction, but it's a charitable um, visitor attraction. Right. So, so it is a charity in its own right. It's a charity in its own right. right. Restoration, preservation, education. You know, we'd love to do much more, but like all these things, the museum has to sort of be self-sufficient. And right. we have to, you know, we try and run it as a business, which is why we have all the various elements to the museum, the conferencing, the Haynes Heritage Engineering, which is where this car came to you from. Right. Um, and this particular uh, car was from my, my own private collection that I purchased a couple of years ago and buying it knowing it needed some fettling and I put it into the Heritage Engineering Works at the museum and uh, we sort of realised that the engine needed quite a serious overhaul and at that point I said I know just the man for the job. <laughs> But he wasn't available. Yeah, he wasn't available. So you so called me instead. <laughs> yes. Well, no, I think you were third. Oh, oh. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Touche. Yes. <laughs> uh, great. Okay. So this is your one of your own fleet. As it yeah. Um, and uh, well, that's wonderful. Um, so there you go. Um, whatever you do, if you're in in the southwest of England, come and visit the Haynes Museum because it's fantastic. 
uh, yeah, so um, there we are, Chris. Thank you. Hide from much. the heat. Hide from the heat. <laughs> it's very hot here today. It's very Crazy. hot. Crazy. Um, thank you very much You're for welcome. your custom. No. Thank you for your hospitality. I can't thank you enough. Oh, it's absolutely magnificent and uh, glorious. Well, done a first -class you know job. your cars. Well, so taking. I that I'm, I'm very much looking forward to going to events and shows and getting my pound. I'm going to carry a pound. Who carries a pound coin? I'm going to be carrying a pound coin from now on. <laughs> well, I may have to come and retune it, of course. <laughs> well, that's true. Yes. Well, yeah. some, I'm sure there's other things that we can have a conversation about. Great. Okay. Well, um, I look forward to that. But thank you again. No, thank you. Get onto the sort of power band and just yeah. feel it. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry to be the uh, no, the big don't bad be sorry. <laughs> oh, don't be sorry. It's magnificent. I should be saying that in Italian. My my children are calling the car the mob boss car. <laughs> Any black Ferrari has to be has to be a bit sinister, doesn't oh, it? Oh yes. <laughs> bad boy. It's just so beautiful, the idea. It is, isn't it? Just so, you know, considering it was his, it was his first production car, wasn't it? This yeah. Car with a proper sort of wide seats and all that kind of... Yeah, exactly. And this was the first car sold in Britain, allegedly. Well, yeah. I, I know it was the second one in to one of two that came in, but apparently the first one that was sold, so... Yeah. No, it had to be, uh, I had to have it when I found it. Are you happy? Oh, yes. Oh, good. I'm very happy. That's what we like to hear. We like happy customers. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. I hope you've enjoyed it, and please remember to like and subscribe, it does help. And uh, we'll be back with something else very soon.